and we are, we are thinking about those forgotten lives uh, of people uh, from our past who uh, have not been remembered as they should have been and of course there are some who are now quite well known as next week uh, Leia herself what I think we'll talk about Rabbi Regina Jonas but the names of some of the people you might not have never have heard of and of course this is one of the most important aspects of our commitment um, perhaps particularly because we're liberal Jews and we were founded by a woman uh, and that we've had women in our leadership uh, for all of our history including of course more recently Rosita Rosenberg that we think particularly that it's important that the equality of memory uh, is is of course given to all just to say a word about this notion of filling the half empty bookcase uh, it's a phrase that came from Rabbi Larry Hoffman at Hebrew Union College in New York and um, passed on to uh, my wife Rabbi Marsha Plum who brought it to the UK when she founded an organization called the Half Empty Bookcase which was a, a commitment to fill our Jewish bookcase with the voices and the words of those who had been forgotten particularly women in leadership roles in Jewish history and we have continued to do that work uh, over the last number of years and this series contributes to that as well. The notion that um, we're filling uh, a half empty bookcase uh, is of course um, an important reminder that by looking at history or reading history books doesn't necessarily give us the full story. Most of the histories that we might read will of course not mention those who were forgotten which means to say we need to look beyond the spectrum of light that we would normally look at this is a, a metaphor that again rabbi larry hoffman gave us which is the suggestion that if we're looking only in the spectrum of the light that we normally see we perhaps won't see those hidden lives but if we go into the ultraviolet or the infrared aspects of the spectrum things that we don't normally look at maybe we'll find other voices, other players. And that's somewhat of what I want to say about Otti Berger today is that by reading books about the Bauhaus from say 10 or 20 years ago, you will not find her name. But by beginning to uncover research that has been done both in Germany and in the United States that have brought to light not only her, uh, her writing um, and her photographs, but also, amazingly, uh, samples of her of her textile textile work, and who knew that samples of that work um, would still exist, and that we have been able to find and um, produce them. Uh, so, I want to share with you today the story um, of Otti Berger. I'm going to share my screen. And I hope now you can see uh, the slides uh, in front of you. If you have any problems with seeing anything or hearing anything uh, along the way, do, uh, do let me know in the chat or any other way. Um, so, as I say, we're filling the half empty bookcase and we're talking about Otti Berger uh, and the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus was, of course, the very famous school of art and architecture that existed from 1919 in Germany. I first came across the name Otti Berger because um, two years ago, 2019, I attended a lecture at Harvard University, um, in fact, part of the, uh, the art museum there, which was celebrating 100 years of the Bauhaus from 1919 to 2019. And in an off chance remark, one of the speakers spoke about uh, a young woman named Otti Berger, who I'd never heard of, and told us that Otti Berger um, had been one of the heads of the weaving uh, workshop at the Bauhaus and had subsequently been killed at Auschwitz. That was a remarkable piece of information and one that I couldn't quite grasp as I was sitting there listening to this lecture. So I then did some research and found out that 
particularly in the last two years, but also over a number of years, um, the work of women in the Bauhaus has been amplified and that more and more people have begun to write about her work and the work of her female colleagues who were in the weaving workshop at the Bauhaus. This is a picture of Ottilia Esther Berger, born 1898, died, as we know now, April 1944 in Auschwitz. So I'd like to tell you her story to start off with. She was born in um, the northeast corner of Croatia, up there on the Hungarian border, as part of the former Austria-Hungarian Empire. And she was in a she was born in a very small village to a Jewish family uh, with a, a brother, a mother and father. And it was a happy childhood, a childhood in which she kept the Jewish festivals and the Jewish holidays, and they were part of the cycle of her early life. She was had creative instincts from birth and had a, a real sense of innovation about her creativity and she went to art school in Zagreb. Um, the territory where she lived and studied initially was under dispute. It was disputed um, as part of the new uh, borders that were being drawn around Yugoslavia, but she did eventually get Yugoslavian citizenship and she studied in Zagreb at art school. Now she, she wrote about this later on to say that it was a fairly deadening experience to be at art school but she really wanted to get to the Bauhaus in Germany. And the Bauhaus had been in existence um, already since 1919. And it was in about 1927 that she arrived in Germany. So she's here in her late twenties. She's coming uh, as a supposedly art, uh, qualified art student into this very famous and prestigious art school in Germany. She wrote about the experience of coming to the Bauhaus and she wrote the following. To become an artist, one has to be an artist and to become one when one already is an artist and then one comes to the Bauhaus. And the task of the Bauhaus is to make a human being of the artist again. So she really saw this as an opportunity to uh, develop herself, her artwork and uh, become the woman she wanted to be um, at the Bauhaus. She studied there from 1927, uh, starting in January. And you can see here from the picture already that she's becoming a woman of the 20s, uh, a, a, a liberated woman, a woman uh, who was a woman of her time, maybe even ahead of her time, uh, a woman who wanted to be liberated and free uh, in a more liberal, and open environment than she had experienced in her childhood and uh, in the uh, eastern um, part of the, the world that she had come from. Now, when you arrived at the Bauhaus, you had to um, participate in the opening curriculum. Um, this is a drawing of the schema of the curriculum of the Bauhaus. And if you will know something about art schools, you'll know that every art school today has a foundation course. And the foundation course gives students the opportunity to look at all materials, all aspects of artistic and creative endeavor. Well, it was the Bauhaus that created the foundation course for art schools. And um, the foundation course at the Bauhaus was very famous. It brought people in to look at all kinds of materials. You would do some painting, you'd do some photography, you would do some work with metal, some work with textile, um, and you'd begin to know the feeling of materials and how they would uh, form together to be part of uh, creation. So um, Otti Berger, like many others, um, did one year in the foundation course and then she was assigned to what was called the weaving workshop. Each uh, department had a workshop. There was a, a painting workshop, photography workshop, metal workshop, textile workshop. The workshops were specific places where you would work towards what would be called a journeyman certificate. So you would become uh, certified in that particular form of art. 
it happened to be the case that many women were um, encouraged, shall we say the word, to uh, go to the textile or weaving workshop. So although there were some very few women in the other workshops, most of the women were um, taught inside the weaving and the textile workshop. When she got to the workshop and started her studies there, having uh, spent the year on the foundation course, um, she of course had had a year with an amazing group of teachers, which included people like Paul Clay, Vasily Kandinsky, Laszlo Maholi, uh, Naji, these people who are household words in uh, the world of art and art and design were people who had given her a beginning and a start to the idea that there is a relationship between form and function. This, of course, is a very famous aspect of the Bauhaus's um, philosophy that we should, when we are creating, we should consider both form, that is what an object looks like, uh, its appearance, um, as well as its function, and how the balance and the harmony between form and function take place. So she'd been studying these with some very famous painters, uh, sculptors, um, artists, and she was beginning to learn that the world of uh, creativity involved both uh, color, shape, form, and she added to that in her world texture because she was now in the textile workshop. And texture became a very important part of what she was able to contribute to the future understanding of what uh, textile design was going to be all about. Here you can see some of the aspects of the um, form and function that produced the modern look that the Bauhaus is famous for. You'll probably recognize the Breuer chair, uh, the table lamps that many of us now buy from Ikea. All of these were inspired by the initial creativity of people at the Bauhaus. Now, if you look carefully at say the chairs, you will notice that the tubular steel was an invention of um, Marcel Breuer at the Bauhaus. And the notion of uh, tubular steel furniture, probably you're probably sitting on one at this moment, or you probably got one nearby. Uh, certainly every office now, you know, has tubular steel furniture, whether it's desks or chairs of all sorts. What, what became famous, of course, was the fact that these chairs, uh, the Kandinsky chair, the Breuer chair, were all named after the men who had been working on the metal design to produce these materials. However, um, I suppose it, it's not surprising to many of us here that the women who created the textiles in order to make sure that the chair had the durable fabric that it needed for people to sit on was completely ignored. So in fact, the, it was the, weaving, the women in the weaving workshop who had produced the fabric, the textiles, that allowed this kind of industrial textile to be used uh, in mass produced on an industrial scale for um, both this kind of furniture as well as all the things we're familiar with today in terms of aircrafts, uh, railways, um, cars, the textiles that are used for all of those um, industries are, are have been derived from the creative work and the original work and the experimentation that was done in the workshop at the Bauhaus by um, Otti Berger and her colleagues. Now, um, Otti Berger herself um, came to the Bauhaus, as I said, as a, a young, late 20 year old, and began to work under the head of the workshop, whose name was Gunther Stotzl. Uh, now, Gunther Stotzl was the only woman was head of a department at the Bauhaus. And some of this is surprising in that the Bauhaus was a, a post-World War um, production establishment of a new thinking. And it's surprising perhaps in some ways that women were not considered um, as uh, equal as the men in their work and in their uh, the products that they produced. But 
um, where women did shine, um, there were a couple, a few whose names we know, who have come down to us. And one of them is Gunter Stotzel, who was the head of her department. So um, Oti Berger learns her trade. Uh, and as you can see here on the left, she is wearing Hungarian costume. This costume was the one she wore for her graduation as a journeyman uh, getting her certification. Um, and um, this uh, reminds us that she has come uh, from Eastern Europe, but um, is celebrating her uh, time uh, in traditional Hungarian dress. In the middle picture, you see her sitting on a high loom. This is an industrial style loom, weaving industrial thread uh, and experimenting as she did so. She was someone who didn't use um, prior, prior design, but rather designed on the loom itself. She began to use her imagination and her skill to derive new styles of textiles by working on the loom as they were being produced. Uh, on the right hand side, you see her in her room uh, at the Bauhaus uh, holding, I think, a heart shaped box. Uh, and we'll talk about the, the one to whom her heart had gone to later on. Now, I said earlier that she added to the Bauhaus's philosophy the notion of, uh, of textile and of touch. And the reason why. Um, this was particularly attuned for her was because remarkably she was deaf. So added to the accomplishments and achievements of this young woman having crossed Europe to come to Western Europe to be part of this um, very prestigious academy, to be working uh, inside this weaving workshop and to be designing new materials was also the fact that she was overcoming her deaf disability and of course, having the tactile sense was at highly attuned for her and gave her that uh, sense of accomplishment that others perhaps didn't have so acutely. Now here we see a sample of her weaving and you may ask, how do we have such a sample? Um, and the answer to that we'll come back to later, but you'll see here that she's experimenting with different threads, different designs. Um, she's using color in different ways. And she begins to work towards uh, a unique form of textile design that begins to add um, weaving and threading and twists into her fabric. And as she does so, she begins to move away from this notion of women's work that was considered to be part of the weaving workshop into um, what we now think of as textile design. So she begins to become um, someone who begins the professionalization of this whole endeavor. She uh, is involved in the production of a, a new form of synthetic material called Isengarn which is an iron waxed wool and uh, a plastic thread that is then woven into natural threads to create uh, a very um, permeable and durable material. Of course, for things like industrial use, let's say in aircraft or uh, railway carriages, this of course is very important. But more than that, she also begins to, to think about how textiles can be used in different ways, whether it's for uh, fabric samples that are used for um, grand piano covers, curtains, uh, wall coverings, um, all kinds of different ways of understanding how fabrics can be utilized for different purposes. Again, this notion of form and function coming together. She begins to use plastic fibers and double weave and using color again as a means to represent the different functions that things are used for. Here we come to a new sense of her textile design where she's beginning to look at how luminosity, that is how a material both reflects and refracts light can be important 
in the use of fabric material. Here for a curtain, obviously um, using silk and cotton, she is beginning to see how this uh, playing with light is important in the function of the way in which a curtain works. And you'll see that both the, uh, the weave itself and the edges of the weave become important as a signature of her work. And here also is material she made for uh, a cinema in Zurich uh, in 1932 uh, from a, a shiny weave, a shiny curtain weave that becomes part of her uh, patented material. I want to give you a sense of um, Otti Berger and her writings. She left an essay called Fabric in Space and this essay um, was not known about for a very long time, finally discovered. And um, the material that she wrote in it describes a number of aspects of her work. And I just want to play a small extract of her own view of what she was trying to do with textiles as part of her role uh, at the Bauhaus. And um, I hope you'll be able to hear it. It, it's her words, but it's obviously translated into English and read by uh, an author uh, of her biography. Um, the uh, words came from a lecture that was given at, at Harvard Art Museum uh, again a couple of years ago. For making fabric have no limits. The first requirement is harmony between the various materials. Harmony between hard and soft, thick and thin, matte and glossy. The next requirement is balance in the structure. In other words, the floating and crossing of the various threads in relation to durability, elasticity and hygiene. The third requirement is harmony of color. A final important requirement is the overall balance between purpose and structure and quality and color. Unlimited possibilities open up for anyone who understands these relationships within fabrics. They know that not every material is suitable for every structure. Not every color goes with every material. Material changes through structure. Color changes through material and structure. Smooth structures reflect light, but rough structures almost suck up the light, forming shadows. In this context, it is possible to speak of sculpting in fabric. Fabric becomes a form of expression. So why do we still need flowers, vines, ornaments? The fabric itself is alive. You have to do more than understand the structure with your brain. You have to feel it with your subconscious. Then you will know the particular quality of silk, which is warmth, and of rayon, which is cold. You can grasp the rawness of hemp or wool. We don't want pictures. We want to come to the best possible definitive living fabric. Now fabric in space. This is a functional fabric, and so we must ask about its function and then about its arrangement, whether stretched out, hanging, or laid flat. So you can see here how she so beautifully, wonderfully describes her art, her experimentation, her innovation, almost a spiritual journey for her into understanding the ways in which the, the textiles become part of um, the, uh, the thinking and the ideal reflection of um, what we would like as an ideal in space, sculpture in space, she calls it. Um, when we look at our own hangings, uh, curtains, bed covers, um, um, 
we don't perhaps think so much about how it was created and what was done to build this um, experience for us that does have a light and a touch and a texture that um, is an aesthetic and uh, pleasing for us in many different ways. So um, I want to tell you the second part of the story now. Um, she actually um, is appointed um, to be the uh, head of the weaving workshop for a short period of time when uh, Gunther Schultz leaves on maternity leave. Um, but when um, Gunther Schultz uh, does not return, she's replaced um, by the wife of the new director of the um, Bauhaus. Uh, the director was the new director was Mies van der Rohe, uh, and his wife was appointed the uh, head of the weaving workshop, who happened not to be a weaver. So um, Otti Berger um, was asked to provide the teaching in the workshop, but not given the appointment of head of the workshop. And after a while, this relationship did not last, and she left the Bauhaus in order to form her own uh, workshop in Berlin. And she moved to Berlin and she set up her own independent consulting workshop and textile workshop with some looms that she had purchased. Now, it just so happened that the Bauhaus um, was dissolved in 1933 by the Nazis, feeling that it was um, inappropriate for uh, for the, uh, the regime that they wanted. Uh, and therefore, uh, some of the material that she was able to uh, purchase was from the Bauhaus itself. So in the 1930s, she's living in Berlin. She has her own uh, workshop and she's developing materials um, for her own use. But she does one thing that no one else in the Bauhaus has ever done, which is to actually apply for a patent for her materials. Um, and here, as you can see, in 1932, she uh, receives a patent um, for a material that is called Moppelstoff Doppelsgrabe, um, which is a synthetic material that can be used in for industrial use for textiles. Um, and further to that, she not only patented it, but she managed to sell the production rights to a company. Uh, and the company, um, like uh, most companies, wanted to take her textiles, uh, produce them and sell them. And she refused to do that unless her name was on the, uh, the textile book. And this is a copy of the textile book. And you can see that her name actually is not on it, but however, um, despite the fact that she pressured them to put her name on it, the only thing they would agree to is to put her initials on it. So you see O and B there for Otti Berger. Um, and she's one of the very, very, very few people who have a textile um, named uh, with her initials on it uh, as part of the uh, production manufacturing that went into um, the materials that were produced. She did have various commissions. She was working, as I said, um, producing curtain fabric for a cinema in Zurich. She produced curtains for a house uh, for uh, an architect called Hans Sharon, uh, and she produced all of his co wall coverings and curtains uh, uh, as for that as well. However, by 1936-37, things obviously were getting very difficult for a Jewish professional working in Germany, and uh, the Nazis would no longer renew her professional license. Uh, and she was, I mean, she was already considered uh, an alien because she was actually um, you know, not German uh, anyway, and she lost her ability to live in Germany. She, um, she worked with other people from the Bauhaus who had already started to leave the country, and um, particularly with Walter Gropius, the, the, for, the first director of the Bauhaus, and she managed to get a, a visa to come to Britain. And this is where the connection with England comes in. So she comes to Britain and she uh, looks for work. However, she doesn't speak English, she's deaf, so she can hardly learn, uh, or it makes it, it makes it very difficult to learn a new language. And she's finding it very difficult to find work in uh, England. Um, she's living in London, but she finds work in Bolton, of all places, at a textile manufacturing company um, that's called Helios. 
Now, Helios, and I did not know this until about a year ago, uh, Helios was founded by um, Felix Lowenstein. Felix Lowenstein was a, uh, a Jewish uh, merchant in Manchester, um, and Helios uh, employed a number of uh, people from the Bauhaus who were designing materials for their company. Um, Helios had been a subsidy of Barlow and Jones, if you if you know that name from the Manchester area, and uh, it turns out that Felix Lowenstein's great niece uh, is a woman called Anne Angel, who's a member of Menorah Reform Synagogue in Manchester, and happens to be a, an old friend of mine. And I did not know that when I uh, started doing this research. So you never know where it takes you when you start making these connections. Um, back to the question of where her samples came from. Well, it just so happens that because she was working in Bolton, some of her samples ended up at the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester. And um, they have been in the basement unseen for these past years. And it's only now that they have realized what they have and they're beginning to look at them more carefully. However, I have to tell you, and I'm sorry to tell you this, that she hated it in England um, for two reasons. Uh, one, because she couldn't get work. And two, because she felt that the artistic um, and aesthetic um, tastes in Britain were just so far behind those she had experienced in Germany. And she writes a little bit about that, and we will hear her speaking about it a little bit. Otti Berger, 8 Gordon Street, London, July 1938. Dear Slava, I am always alone and things are so hard for me because I can't speak English and can't hear that you really can't imagine that. The English are very reserved. I just can't picture my future. Now it seems that this place will not be the last stop for me either, and I'll probably keep going further, probably to America. Ah, Slava, do you have any idea how tired of this I am? We moderns thought we were so important, especially within the monastery walls of the Bauhaus. Now you can see just how little we were needed. Even most moderns have no idea about the essentials, and the others feel quite happy in their old or modern rubbish. In Germany, it was quite different. There was the Werkbund organization, which backed us and dealt with the entire industry. If everything hadn't been wrecked by political interventions, there could have been extraordinary things achieved in these last years. The masses were prepared there, and it would not have been so hard to bring our work closer to them. But here? Like being dropped in the Middle Ages. The whole modern thing is for snobs. They connect with things that we already overcame. With cubism. Exactly what we fight so hard against. Formalism. In that respect, I am very pessimistic. Maybe I am being pessimistic. If I wanted to start all over again now, I would run a chicken farm. That would have some meaning. So you can see she's quite depressed. Um, this has had a negative impact on her life, on her work, her mental health, and um, things are not going so well for her, although she's in a safe place. And that, of course, is the irony that just the physicality of being in a safe place, not enough. Um, and she does, however, um, produce a few things while she's in London, and this is one. Uh, I don't know if you can see it so well. It's actually a fabric um, as a, a greeting for, the, for Christmas and the New Year. So it's a woven fabric. It's, um, it's written on it. It's a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, Otty Berger, uh, 5 Gordon Street, London, WC1, where she was living. Um, at the top in red 
you can just about make out some little signs um, which might be, we're not entirely sure what those are. They might be the formula for the weaving um, that in order to create the piece, uh, or it could be some kind of a weaving signature. Um, but it almost also looks like the staves on a music scale. So it, it has um, a number of resonances uh, and um, again, is a, a sign of her creativity and, and innovation while she was still in Britain. I said earlier that she had given her heart to someone, and this was Ludwig Hilbersheimer. Uh, he was an architect and had been at the Bauhaus and had gone to Chicago uh, to uh, be part of the Art Institute in Chicago, which was uh, going to be, if you like, the next rendition of the Bauhaus was going to be opened in Chicago uh, under the, the work of um, uh, various of the, uh, the alumni of the Bauhaus. And Hilba Seimer uh, urged her to come to Chicago and was active in trying to get her a visa to get to America. And of course, this is what she was dying for, to be able to do that. And um, the tragedy is that her mother fell ill in Yugoslavia. So she felt she had to go back to Yugoslavia. So she left Britain. She went to Yugoslavia in 1938. And uh, she nursed her mother for a year in Yugoslavia and she spent time with her and her brother there back at home. And of course, by the time the visa came through, the war had started and it was too late. So she lived with her family and mother um, and she wrote a little bit about how she was feeling about that time. And well, this is the last extract we'll hear from her. Um, about this, these last years in Yugoslavia in 1941. Nineteen forty one. Otti Berger, Smajewatz, Baranja, Yugoslavia. My dear Pia, how happy I am with your letter, if you only knew. I haven't much to tell you. The winter was terrible here in the village. My brother and I are running in narrow circles like two lions in a cage. My poor mother is our keeper, but her loving gaze always calms us down. My brother is still making collections, and he is a marvel. Isolated here without any stimulation, he made his collection and they are buying it in New York. Over 1,000 dinars postage in Budapest and, of course, Belgrade. For my part, back in autumn, I began making carpets, but I had no material then and unsuitable colors. Then the dyer made me wait two months, and so on. But now I have the material to some extent. And hooray, it will be the most beautiful carpet of the age. Which isn't saying much, since mostly terrible ones are made. So, now I am actually completely happy. I work on it the whole day. It is a dark lighter blue and dark red pink, etc. From far off it looks plain, a shimmering surface of one color, but then close up you can see the structures. Have you any idea what a joy it is to make a rug? Of course, I made no design on paper beforehand. I just went at it. That way I'm not tied down. And anyway, working to a pre-established design is not my thing. That way it would always have something stiff and paperish about it. I only know what I want. And sometimes I want to dictate things. Sometimes the rug is in charge. It is 180 centimeters wide and will be around 2.25 meters long. At first I began quite dark and now the first ray of sunshine is already in it and afterward the spring and summer colors will come into it. Wait and see. Will I ever be able to show it to you? Otherwise I have no prospect of work here. For a while this was very distressing, but now the rug consoles me. Our greatest worry, of course, is that the war will somehow catch up with us. Until now, we are keeping our balance okay. 
Hopefully things will stay like that. So Otty Berger's um, world is reduced to making a carpet in her hometown in Yugoslavia. And um, it is only later that we find out that Yad Vashem records her death in Auschwitz on April the 27th, 1944. So here is a woman who made a huge contribution to the world of textile design, who was the first one to patent the uh, textiles that she produced and to have her name listed uh, on production design material. She uh, goes down in history as someone who made an enormous, important significance to every single piece of furniture you sit on, whether it's in a at home uh, in a railway carriage or an airliner, um, whether it's curtain fabric or indeed something that um, covers any kind of material, someone who really understood the relationship, the harmony, the balance between texture, color, shape, form and function. And it really uh, espoused the, the very essence of what the Bauhaus was all about and who was forgotten. Um, the others from the weaving workshop, like Annie Albers, uh, went to Chicago and made a name for herself and her work. Um, and there have been museum retrospectives of her work. Um, the one thing that um, is still available to us is a suitcase, a suitcase that she left behind in London. It had a thousand samples in it and it was sent from London to New York to Harvard um, where Walter Gropius was the professor of architecture uh, and Walter Gropius opened it and found a thousand samples of Otti Berger's work and donated it to the Art Museum in, at Harvard. Uh, and today the, art, the Harvard Art Museum uh, treasures that collection and has recently done a retrospective on her work as well. So we are beginning to come out of a, uh, the infrared and the ultraviolet parts of the spectrum into the natural light and we're beginning to learn of women and particularly this woman who did so much um, to contribute to uh, the future uh, way in which in which we live the modern life. Some more pictures of her here. So I'm going to stop sharing and then we can talk together about um, any questions, comments, thoughts you might have, um, any knowledge you might have of her work or her life um, that you can add to our story. You're going to have to unmute and I hope you can do that yourself. Um, if um, Tom comes, if Tom is with us still, yeah, he... I've, uh, I've just given people the ability to unmute themselves. Okay, so you can unmute yourself. Um, and I, I see we have guests from Russia here, um, which is wonderful, lovely to see you. Um, any questions or comments or thoughts? Oh, you can put something in the chat too. Yes, go ahead, Jane. Yeah, I, I, my name's Jane. I'm in Chiswick, London. Um, that was fascinating. I've never heard of her. I did a lot of, when in my younger days, I did some work on the Bauhaus and never heard of her, which is incredible and sad. And are they going to do a retrospective in England? I mean, uh, <sighs> one feels that there ought to be something, because I've heard of, um, there was a recent exhibition of Albers, was it? Yes, in, Annie Albers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and um, it would seem the honourable thing to do would be to um, have something about her. You know, a woman, you know, I feel quite, quite shocked, actually. Quite shocked. Yes, I, it was an amazing story to learn about and to reveal, um, 
I'm hoping the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester will honor the collection they have there and maybe do something about her, particularly with the connection to, to Bolton and to the weaving and the manufacturing industry that was up there. Um, I can tell you she also actually went to Dartmouth to the, to the uh, manufacturing um, college down in Dartmouth, but she couldn't find any work there either and she left and came back to London. So I don't think England did her so well, which was tragic and very unfortunate. Um, would she have stayed if, um, if she had had work? Um, that might have been a different ending. And um, so yes, Jane, I, I agree with you, absolutely. But, but of course, everyone should hold on to the hats because we're going to have, what, six weeks of, of women who have been hidden away. And um, there's going to be more of this, I'm afraid. But we're here we are. We're doing it now. We're honoring her life and work. And isn't that wonderful? Amazing. And, and to see that texture and to see that, oh, I'd love to just you know, reproduce it and touch it. You know, it's amazing. Thank you. Um, I can tell you one more connection um, while we're waiting to see if there's anyone else who wants to comment. Um, so my mother is is here, Ruth Shire, she's in Birmingham. I don't know, Mum, if you can unmute yourself. Can you do that? Because it would be lovely to hear about Tibor Reich and his connection to the Bauhaus. Yeah, there you are, Mum. Yeah, you can speak now. But look up. Look up and speak. My mother loves to look down. I said it all right. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Perhaps you tell us the story of Tibor Reich and the, the fabric that we have in our house in Birmingham. Yes. Um, some, a member of our synagogue was called Tibor Reich. He was Hungarian. <clears throat> and he started a factory in Stratford, which was very successful because he eventually... Re she or he refurbished the whole theater in Stratford. The red, when you go into now, is really the work of the Bauhaus, and I like to think the work of Otti Berger. But the, the curtain we have comes from Tibor Rice factory in Stratford, and he was using her patterns. Um, it's a, the curtain, I would say, is now 40 years old. It's been cleaned several times, but the material is so strong and so good that you can use it perfectly well, except the lining. The lining was gone. And she there uses already the fabric that has the shiny what she calls das Eisendraht, the very special thread which gives off the light, and especially at night, would always reflect in a drawing room the light of the lovely chandeliers. So she really is a very, very wonderful, creative woman who was not well known in her time, but we certainly know her now and appreciate her patterns and her wonderful imagination as regards color and balance and texture. And it looks marvelous in good space. Great. Thank you, Mum. I just want to make sure everyone realizes we don't have chandeliers in our house, um, but when other people do. Um, yeah. But that that hanging that we have in our house has been, as Mum said, has been with us for 40 years. Uh, I had no idea what it was and who where it was from and how what the connection was to the this research I've been doing about Otto Berger. So it all it all comes around in a big circle. Uh, any other final questions or thoughts? I know we, we have, have one from Alexandra. I'm going to bring her in now. Alexandra. Oh, there you are. Hi, Alexandra. Hi. Hi. So I guess my first sort of thought was, um, oh, you know, what a shame. It, it, it's all lost. All of the, all her, her creativity is lost. But then you go back and, and you hear about the suitcase with a thousand samples in, and it, it's it's just 
it's not lost. It wasn't for nothing. It's here. And, um, you know, we can celebrate now. And, you know, I, I think it's maybe maybe she wasn't recognized so much in her time, but we can do that now. Absolutely, we can. There is actually a new book called Women of the Bauhaus, and she does have uh, one section in it. And um, so more and more people will learn about her. I, I hope people will also understand that um, not only has she made a contribution um, to the textile world, but she stands as a humanitarian, I think, and as a, as a guide for us in understanding some of the spiritual aspects of the work that people do, the, to bring that sense of knowing and understanding to whatever work you do, is to really uh, is to really be someone who can can help guide us as well. But thank you for that. Yes. Super. Um, so perhaps a bit of a plug for next week, Tom. Did you want to do that? Yeah, I will come back on when I'm anybody else. Start my video. Anybody else who wanted to suggest any comments or thoughts? Be interesting to know if you want to email me or, or talk to me later about how much you knew of this story beforehand, or how how much it's new, and and whether any of it um, has been known. My spotlights are going a bit haywire there. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, um, for that. It was fascinating. I had, certainly had no, I mean, very forgotten because I didn't know anything about her before. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing uh, this evening. Um, as Michael said, we have uh, five more sessions over the coming weeks. Um, next week, um, the 20th, 20th of October, Wednesday, same time, um, we will have Rabbi Leah Mulstein with us. Um, talking about Rabbi Regina Jonas. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm sure that she will uh, guide us next week to the correct pronunciation, if not. Um, so thank you, everyone, especially Michael. Thank you very, very much. Um, and uh, yeah, see you all next week. Thank you. <laughs>